Wow, there are a lot of Imperator Rome tutorials already. It's a good thing you found the best one. Let's jump in. What's so funny about Biggest Dickus? Well, it's a joke name, sir. I have a very great friend in Rome called Biggest Dickus. <laughs> Every country hosts important families. These families are a collection of characters. Characters have stats which determine how well they perform different tasks. These stats are influenced by traits, which sometimes have further effects. Characters have various scores. The most important is their loyalty score. A disloyal character might do something naughty, like start a decades-long civil war. On the top of your screen, you'll find your currencies. This includes your treasury, which is self-explanatory. All I'll say about it is don't run out of money. Bad things happen. There are also your four powers. Each power is a currency that's generated from your ruler. Each power can be spent on different things. Pops are at the center of Imperator Rome. Each one has a religion, a culture, and a type. There are four types. Slaves are the backbone of your economy. They produce your trade goods and pay your taxes. Jeez, forced labor and taxes? Being a slave is tough. Anyway, freemen give you your manpower. Tribesmen give you a small amount of manpower and income, but less so than freemen and slaves. This means that one freeman and one slave are worth much more than two tribesmen. Last are citizens, who produce research and generate commerce income. Now that we know our characters, let's use them to staff our government. Are you the Judean People's Front? Fuck off! What? Judean People's Front! Well, the People's Front of Judea! You assign characters to offices in your government. Each office gives a bonus that gets bigger the better the assigned character is. Here you'll find your country's idea slots. You can put any idea you want into these slots, but if all of the ideas match their slot's type, you get an additional, very powerful bonus. Governments also feature laws. There are multiple categories of law, each with a set of options that give different bonuses and drawbacks. There are different types of government, each with their own mechanics. Monarchies choose their monarch by inheritance. Each monarch has a legitimacy score. A monarch with low legitimacy will suffer from loyalty problems, and eventually civil wars. Succession tends to cause an issue with monarchies, as new rulers don't usually have high legitimacy, and other potential successors will try to start civil wars. Republics don't suffer the instability of a monarchy. Republics have a senate whose seats are held by different factions. Each faction brings different bonuses, and sometimes penalties, when in charge. The downside is that you need the senate's approval to take certain actions, including declaring war. Last are tribes. Tribes can either be migratory or settled. A migratory tribe can spend oratory power to have entire cities pack up and move somewhere else. A settled tribe can't do this, but they're more powerful in other ways. Tribes have chiefs. Chiefs each have their own armies of multiple cohorts. These armies don't cost anything to maintain, so even a small tribe can be quite powerful. The downside is that if a chief becomes disloyal, they'll have a ready-made army that you can't easily take away from them. When it comes to pops, tribes get more out of their tribesmen than other governments. With that all sorted, let's turn to religion, trade, and diplomacy. I'm not the Messiah, will you please listen? I am not the Messiah, do you understand? Honestly! Only the true Messiah denies his divinity! What? Well, what sort of chance does that give me? All right, I am the Messiah! He is! He is, he is the Messiah! Now, fuck off! The religion screen is used to get omens for your country. You spend religious power to get these omens. Omens can be made stronger by having a religiously homogeneous population. This means that if you're a Hellenic ruler in a Kemetic country like Egypt, your omens won't be very powerful. For special bonuses, and to train specialized troops, you'll need trade goods. Every city produces a trade good, and for every 15 slaves in a city, you get an additional copy of that good. Having a surplus of a good gives several options. The first is to just keep it. Each additional copy of a good gives a stacking bonus. If the surplus is in your capital province, you'll get an empire-wide bonus. If you want the benefits of a trade good that a province doesn't have, you can import the good from another province, or even from another country. If you export goods to other countries, you get an export bonus. Whenever trading goods, you also get some commerce income. Diplomacy is mostly straightforward. You select a stance which modifies how other countries perceive you. To make an arrangement with a country, you select the offer you want to make them and they give a response. That's simple enough, but alliances are a bit more complicated. All countries are organized into power tiers, ranging from city-state to great power. Only countries of the same tier can form an alliance. With foreign affairs covered, let's go back to internal affairs, and how to stop them from falling apart. Look, 
Those idiots don't even know where we live. As your empire grows, you'll find yourself dealing with aggressive expansion, tyranny, and disloyalty. Aggressive expansion grows as your empire does, and it goes away with time. While you have aggressive expansion, pops in your empire who have a different culture will be unhappy. A good way to avoid the issues caused by aggressive expansion is to assimilate pops to your culture. This can be done either by spending oratory power or through governor policies. Governor policies can also do other things, like convert religion, increase tax revenue, and create more trade routes. Tyranny increases when you perform tyrannical and corrupt actions. It's like the opposite of aggressive expansion in that it makes pops of your own culture unhappy. Like aggressive expansion, it goes away with time. Having unhappy pops in a province will make the province disloyal. If you have too many disloyal provinces, they'll break away and start a rebellion. This is obviously a bad thing, so keep your pops happy. One last way to make your country stable is through the aptly named stability score. You can spend religious power to raise your stability from the religion menu. These precautions are all great, but the best precaution is the military. Be my friend. Godfather. Good. Someday, and that day may never come, I'll call upon you to do a service for me. Armies are made out of cohorts of 1,000 men. The men for a cohort come from your manpower. Whenever your cohorts take losses, the replacements will also come from your manpower. Each type of cohort gets bonuses and penalties when fighting against other types of cohort. Armies are each set to use a tactic. These tactics give bonuses to different types of cohorts. They give another bonus when fighting against armies using other tactics. Armies are led by a commander. The better the commander, the better the army will fight. This does come with an issue. Cohorts in the army might become loyal to their commander. This isn't an issue in of itself, but it can become one if the general is disloyal too. Disloyal generals won't do what you tell them to. Even worse is that they'll try to start a civil war. Losing a civil war is an instant game over. To avoid one, divide your cohorts between multiple armies so no one commander becomes too powerful. If a commander does become a problem, you can try to make him loyal through bribery, or hold a triumph. Alternatively, you can use the reward veteran's action to make some of his cohorts stop being loyal, or encourage desertion to weaken him. All countries have a military tradition. Each tradition has three branches. Different traditions and branches specialize in different types of cohorts. You spend military power to get the next tradition in each branch. If you have all of a branch's traditions, you get a final very powerful bonus. With our military ready, and hopefully loyal, let's go to war. When you declare war, you need a casus belli. You can declare without one, but there's a stability penalty when doing this. The easiest way to get a casus belli is to fabricate a claim by spending oratory power. To win a war, you need to gain war score by defeating enemy armies and capturing their cities. Interestingly, the greatest danger to your troops isn't always enemy armies, but attrition. Let's back up a little. Armies made out of powerful cohorts like elephants and heavy cavalry are great at winning battles. But there's a downside. Every cohort has a weight, and every city has a supply limit. If an army's total weight is above the limit, it'll suffer attrition. I've had my entire country's manpower reserves destroyed by attrition. The trick to avoiding it is to have armies built for a purpose. Have your heavy units like elephants and heavy infantry and dedicated combat armies, and units that don't suffer much attrition like skirmishers and dedicated siege armies. Also, watch out for deserts. Those give attrition no matter the unit's weight. If you ever find your manpower reserves getting low, or just need troops fast, you can hire mercenaries. You find them wandering around the world. You don't pay mercenaries up front, but you do pay them a fee to stay in your employ, and then pay them a lump sum when you fire them. If you don't pay the mercenaries, they can cause problems. When it comes to fighting battles, you'll want to do everything you can to stack the odds in your favor. Even if you can win without using special tricks, you don't want to lose any more of your limited manpower than you have to. To stack the odds in your favor, you'll need to choose a good place for the battle. Some terrain types like hills and forests give penalties to attackers. Rivers also give a penalty to attackers. If you can consistently lure the enemy into attacking you while in a good position, ideally a hill or forest with a river, you'll be in great shape. When trying to conquer enemy cities, you'll need to deal with forts. Armies can't walk past forts unless there's a very wide route. Capturing a fort takes much longer than a regular city. 
To be able to capture a fort, we need 5,000 men for every level of the fort. This means that high-level forts can kill tons of soldiers through attrition. Even worse is that if an army attacks another army besieging a fort, the besieging army will be considered the attacker for that battle. This means forts can be extremely dangerous to attack if they're situated in hills or forests. To end a war, you need to make a peace treaty. In a peace treaty, you can demand individual cities, entire provinces, or turn the enemy into a vassal. To be able to conquer a province, you need to control its capital city. If you fully annex a country, you get to choose what happens to its families. If you're short on skilled characters, it's worth taking some of the larger families in. Otherwise, pick the option that helps you the most. Alright, we did it! That was the last important mechanic in Imperator Rome. This last part of the video will be dedicated towards discussing some of the more interesting countries in the game. Alright, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Brought peace? Oh, peace! Shut up! Playing Rome can make you feel like the game is easy. Nothing feels better than watching your legions of heavy infantry with great commanders crush enemies while at number 2 to 1. When playing Rome, you're surrounded by weak nations. Even better is that whenever you enter a new area, an event will pop up giving you a free cast a spell eye against the locals, saving you valuable oratory power. All of this together makes it easy to rapidly expand. This rapid expansion can leave you with large amounts of aggressive expansion and a largely non-Roman population. This combination can easily cause rebellions and civil wars. As long as you're careful about expansion, Rome is a great country to learn the game with. Carthage was Rome's great rival. Like Rome, Carthage is a republic, but that's where the similarity ends. Carthage is primarily a sea power, controlling many islands, while Rome is a land power. Much like in history, a clash between Carthage and Rome is inevitable. Carthage also starts with some cities in Spain, which you can use as a jumping off point to grow an Iberian Empire. No, the other Iberia. You know what this place needs? Giant fucking triangles. That's what. Egypt is also a good option for new players. It starts in a relatively secure position, with only one powerful enemy. That enemy is Phrygia. Most of your time with Egypt will be spent preparing for war against, and then fighting Phrygia. One thing to note about Egypt is that it doesn't have any iron or wood, meaning you'll have to import them if you want heavy infantry or ships. Ships, by the way, are very useful for fighting against Phrygia, as you can use them to rapidly maneuver around the Mediterranean coast while their armies suffer severe attrition trying to chase you. And they call it a mine. A mine! If you want to start the game with a large empire, the biggest one in the game in fact, then Moria is the country for you. Northern India, Moria's heartland, is full to the brim with high population cities who produce extremely valuable trade goods, including silk and elephants. To the south, no one is strong enough to challenge you, and the only country that comes close to a threat is the Seleucid Empire. The biggest challenge with Moria will come from inside, as you have a lot of different ethnicities in your empire who would really rather be their own countries. Be prepared for a civil war. Last are the Barbarians who are far too numerous to pick a single or a few countries from, so I'll just talk about them in general. Barbarians come in two flavors, migratory and settled. I covered the differences already, so all I'll say is that when picking a barbarian country, your main considerations will be its territory and its leader. If you want to form a massive empire, pick one of the larger barbarian countries. If you want a challenge, pick a smaller one with large neighbors. You have a ton of options. That was Imperator Rome. Feel free to ask any questions you have in the comments, I'll get back to you pretty quick. More Imperator Rome content to come. See you then. And Hannibal had elephants. We were a republic, a government run by elected ones who we call representatives. The branch is called the Senate, is controlled by nobles called patricians, but the poorer citizens and workers were called plebeians who chose the citizens' assembly. My name's on the calendar. My name's on the calendar. No, for real, look at August. My name's on the calendar. We got concrete to build arch bridges. We got